नैते श्रुति पाथ जानन योगी मुहति कश्चन तस्मु कालेशु this verse is a fabulous conclusion of all the verses right from the first one onwards so what he's saying here is o partha that yogi who knows these paths is never deluded a person who understands the path of return the path of non return never gets deluded tasmat therefore sarveshu kaleshu at all times yoga yukto bhav arjuna be established in yoga o arjuna so knowing these two paths means you understanding the limitation the pitfalls of both the path of return and the path of non return means he is subtly suggesting he hasn't said it he hasn't spelt it out throughout this chapter he doesn't spell it out but the underlying theme is kaivalya mukti kaivalya mukti means realization here and now when he says here and now as we said earlier maybe you may not reach the state of realization in this janma but sometime you'll reach it. as against this eternal path it just goes on and on and on so you can know something only when you've transcended it so a person who really knows the path of return and non return is one who knows a third alternative the third alternative see it's like this um now these um non stop flights have come from here to the united states right before this it was not possible you had to take a break somewhere why did these non stop flights come because people they understood that a person who really wants to go to the united states from here is not interested in going to dubai you know suppose a airline offers you have to go to new york for a specific purpose on a specific date and the airline says why don't you go via dubai i'll give you 3 days free holiday free uh, hotel this that and the free shopping would you be interested because you're not that's an impediment that's a, a definite disturbance in your mission so you say no get me there in the quickest possible time but still you have to take one stop and go there now what would you say to a person who gets a ticket via dubai gets the three day holiday there he gets so involved there and does so much shopping there that he is he is exhausted of all his money he can only come back what happens to his trip his job there in new york gone what would you call such a person hmm mooda fool what we don't understand is we all fall in this category we go there and return we go half way and return slightly better than that is a person who says why not i've never visited dubai and now i'm getting a free chance to get to dubai so i'll go there enjoy my 3 days and go to new york and do my job to whatever i want to do this is the path of non return but a person who is totally fixed is very important work there in new york and it's a matter of life and death for him he's totally focused on getting there he doesn't care about going to dubai or uh, timbuktu for that matter he says get me there as quickly as possible so what does he do he gets on to this 14 hour flight non stop he is the most sensible person because if you want to go to dubai why don't you go there and come back but you can't go there see thinking that you are in transit on the way i'll go there for 3 days get stuck and then you are left with no option but to come back that's a horrible thing if your mission is to go there and complete your job why would you waste your time in dubai for 3 days still doesn't make sense this you see clearly 
But when it comes to our life, this clarity goes because of desires, because of attachment, because of lack of sincerity. You know, the problem is we are not true to ourselves. We are not sincere even with ourselves. How can you be true to anybody else? And therefore it is that we, because this sincerity is lacking, you want to make up for it by going around impressing other people. Nobody, you see, no sensible person will get impressed. And the fools who get impressed are not worth impressing because they don't see the truth. So get back to yourself and find out where you're being insincere with yourself and tackle that. Once you do that, you're settled for life. You don't need any external help or prop. All you need is your determination. Look at all the examples. Nachiketas did not go and consult anybody. He knew exactly what he had to do and he did it. Pralada did not have to go consulting anybody or taking anyone's help. He knew exactly what he had to do. He did it. Dhruva did not fall. You know, the story goes that his uh, tapasya and his meditation, his single-pointed pursuit of Atman was so attractive, was so impressive, that apparently God himself appeared before him and said, Dhruva, I'm here before you open your eyes. Dhruva said, with his eyes shut, he said, my mother told me that God is within. If you are God, you come inside. And apparently God was just trying to test him, you know. So what it means is in life, we, we come across various tests. It's not that God is trying to test us. The world itself is like that. The higher you go, the more you achieve, the greater are the pitfalls, the great higher are the temptations that come your way. And so you have to uh, fortify yourself and keep saying no to all the temptations that come along. Why? Because your attention is on the prize. The prize is realization. This is true in the spiritual sense. Now let come down to the relative. Fix a goal. Fix a goal that is beyond your selfish, self-centered interests. And the moment you fix a higher goal, and you're working dedicatedly, dedicatedly towards it, the returns will come to you. Money will be offered to you. People will come and say, why don't you be my brand ambassador? And somebody else will come and say, I will sponsor you around the whole world. I will sponsor your lectures. But I have to speak for 45 minutes in the first day. Then you turn around and say, if you want to speak, why don't you sponsor your own lectures? You know, there is always a catch everywhere. And you've got to be wise enough to see where the catch is and call the bluff. It's not a question of you're not wanting help. It's not a question of you're being arrogant. It's a question of you have fixed a goal and you've got to be true to that goal. Anything that comes in the way, just say no to it, finish. Nothing will happen. But we don't have the courage to say no to even the slightest temptation. Somebody comes and offers a meal at a five-star hotel and you succumb. But such a person is never an achiever. Similarly, challenges come. People will come and say, Yo, what are you doing? This is a mad act. You will never succeed. Plod along. Keep going, keep moving. Someday you'll achieve success. So that's what he's saying here. A yogi is one who knows these paths. What does it mean? A yogi is, uh, the moment we say yogi, either you think of a fellow who's doing shavasan or shirshasan, standing on his head. Or you think of a fellow with a long beard, long hair sitting in the Himalayas. None, none of this is attractive to us. But what he means by yogi is a person who is very much in the world, he interacts with the world, he lives in the world, he participates in the world like any one of us. But one aspect of his concentration is beyond the world. And that's what makes him so attractive. 
you look at anyone it is objectivity in a person that is so attractive you know? when you know a person is disinterested that's what drives you towards the person when you if you feel that the person is running after you then you lose all interest in the person so that that's the way it is in the world so the moment you show disinterest in the world the world will come to you everything will come to you on a platter the key is disinterest and how do you get this disinterest you you are disinterested in lower things only when you are totally absorbed in something higher and that is so fantastic i told you of this professor i met in a college his attention is completely dedicated to his field of knowledge and that itself makes him so pure makes the person so attractive because you know he's not interested in anything else he's not even interested in awards and uh, the rest of it just the pursuit of knowledge anything that you do if you're true to it it gives you a tremendous power tremendous energy and great happiness so that's all that you need to follow so the yogi who knows these paths is never deluded tasmat sarveshu kaleshu yoga yukto bhavarjuna now what is this yoga yukta mean it's best understood through examples through a story there is this immortal story about a king uh, a state in which they had this very strange practice where they would appoint a new king every 5 years and at the end of those 5 years that king would be ferried across the river to the other shore which was wild jungle and left there to be devoured by wild animals so what would happen is every 5 years when a new king was appointed that king didn't want to remember what was going to happen to him 5 years later all that he was concerned with is that suddenly out of nowhere he's become king so he enjoyed the wealth the power the influence and the rest of it that came along with his kingship and he had no time to think of the future by the time the second year came periodically the thought would come into his mind that oh my god my death is approaching but he continued and enjoyed what the throne offered him the third year is a positive disturbance fourth year he found he couldn't sleep properly fifth year he couldn't enjoy anything that was uh, presented to him because he was obsessed with the fact that how do i meet with this um, death and on the last day he was in such a state that he usually had to be carried into the boat and ferried across in this scenario one fine day there was a young man who became he opted who elected to be king and what was different about him is that with the passage of time with every year that went by instead of his enjoyment reducing he spartan increased his enjoyment increased his everything seemed to increase and the people around him were wondering says either this fellow is nuts mad or he doesn't know what's going to happen to him but they couldn't tell him for the time being he was the king and then the last year came and his revelry was at its maximum and the day he was to be transported to the other shore he threw a magnificent banquet for all the citizens and waved goodbye to them and walked towards the boat they were all stunned they didn't know what was happening they thought he was a man of realization so he stepped into the boat and he saw this old boatman there his only job was once in 5 years he had to ferry the king across so he looked at the boatman and suddenly realized that i forgotten something so he asked him 
He says, how much are you paid to carry a king once in five years to the other shore? He said, I'm paid 3,000 rupees a month. Then the king looked at him and said, if I doubled your salary, will you, wo will you work for me? For a moment, that boatman thought he was offering him a job in heaven. He was about to say no. But then, by that time, they had reached the other shore. And the boatman looked there and he saw a completely different scenario. Instead of that wild jungle that was there, here was a beautiful city constructed, just a hundred times better than Manhattan. He didn't understand what was happening. Then the king told him, you know what had happened? For every year that this man was king in the previous state, every day of his kingship, along with the parting that went on, along with all his uh, obligations as a king, whatever else that he was doing, he continued doing. But there was one additional thing that he was doing, which was he was systematically transferring all the assets to the other shore and building a city there, new state, where he would be king permanently for life. So this is what he's saying. He says, the yogi who knows these paths is never deluded. The yogi, a person of wisdom, who understands what's happening. See, please understand. There in this example, at least the king had guaranteed five years. Here we are in a condition where we don't have even five minutes guarantee. And yet, we go on as if we are going to live forever here. Not one thought of the future. So here is a person, a yogi, who, like that king, lives in the world like any one of us, establishes relationships, does his business, job, whatever he has to do, enjoys every aspect of life here. But every moment of his life. That's what he says. Sarveshu Kaleshu. Every single moment of his life. He's investing his efforts, his energies in building his future life. And this is well within the capability of each one of us. In fact, you can enjoy the world only when you set aside your assets for a rainy day. You know, it's like um, corporate executive, a senior corporate executive is given everything, the house, the car, the laptop, the cell phone, what else? Club membership, this, that and the other. But he knows that all this remains only as long as he has the job. So. An intelligent executive is one who, along with enjoying the perks that the job gives him and fulfilling his duties in the job, what does he do? He sets aside some amount of energy, time and money to ensuring that he has a reasonable post-retirement life. This is all that he's saying here. Now, the thing with us is there is no post-retirement. In life itself, we have to um, invest. So keep your focus on the goal. And then do whatever is necessary. Enjoy your life here. But invest a little bit of your energies and efforts in assuring your future. That's all that he's saying here. And a yogi is one who does this to the maximum. He's fully engaged in the world apparently, but he's totally disinterested, unconcerned with what's happening in the world because his attention, he understands this is a prison, his attention is in breaking free from the prison. Now we move to the last verse, verse 28.